Lisa Unger is a New York Times and internationally best-selling author with books published in 28 languages and millions of copies sold worldwide. She is widely regarded as a master of suspense. Her latest release is Confessions on the 745. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce you to not only a very, very talented author and successful in the doing, but a very down-to-earth lady who was willing at first to come to Sarasota and doubly willing to do this virtually. She did a beautiful job. She is relaxed, she is informative, and I hope you enjoy our keynote speaker, Lisa Unger. Hi, I'm Lisa Unger. I am the New York Times bestselling author of 19 novels, including the upcoming October release, Last Girl Ghosted. Um, I think when I originally agreed to do this talk, I, I think probably we all imagined that we'd be gathering in person, but instead here I am recording from my office in Florida and of course my Labradoodle has just joined us because such is the nature of personal appearances these days. Um, I am recording it months ahead of time to chat with you about writing, you know, because writing doesn't change, right? The world changes around us. We're sort of in a state of chaos and, you know, tumultuous upheaval for the past couple of years and, uh, and we're all adapting. So here we all are. And I'd love to um, give my thanks to Jan Eberly Shaberg um, and also to the National League of American Pen Women for inviting me to speak to all of you. And, you know, hopefully we're just going to connect in the same way that we would if we were all together in one room. And, you know, I hope you'll reach out to me um, at Lisa at LisaUnger.com with questions about this talk. Um, I'd love to hear from you. And, um, you know, I will just get to it. So I, when I first talked to Jan, we discussed, you know, a topic that has been very important to me over the last year since the beginning of the pandemic. It's uh, creativity in chaos. And it's something that I wrote at the beginning of the pandemic to talk about, you know, how to stay creative when the world is in constant change. But of course, that never stops being true. You know, the, world, the chaos is always a factor for the writer. You know, we always have to run a gauntlet to get to that creative space. Um, but I will get to that. I'm just going to start off a little bit about talking about myself because I know that as writers, you know, it's always probably the most fascinating thing to hear from a writer is how they got from, you know, where they were to where they are. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about that and then we'll go on to chatting a little bit about creativity in chaos. So I've been a writer all my life. I don't remember a time in my life before I defined myself that way. And um, I, you know, I, but of course, you know, all writers are readers first. We all like fall in love with story in the page of somebody else's book. And um, we, um, you know, most writers probably then have a moment where you kind of think, wow, if I can be so moved by what somebody else has created, the words on somebody else's page, can I do that? for somebody else. May, can I also weave worlds? Can I also create characters um, and put words on a page that transport somebody else? And so I had this question for my father, who is an engineer, and he was just like, you know, no, you can't do that. Writing is not, <laughs> is not a job. You don't, that's not what people do with their lives. Um, and so I kind of had that message really early on, like, that's great. It's nice that you can string a few coherent sentences together, but that's not what people do. Luckily, on the other hand, my mother was a librarian. Um, and so she knew pretty early on what I was as well. And I always received a lot of encouragement from her and then finally from my teachers. But, you know, I, not surprisingly, when I graduated from college, even though really my entire education had been dedicated to writing, you know, poetry, nonfiction, journalism, um, you know, short stories, the novel, screenwriting, my pretty much my entire 
um, education at the new school in New York City and NYU was dedicated towards that. But when I graduated from university, even though I started my first novel when I was 19 and still in school, I didn't really have the confidence to pursue that dream, that goal, because I just always like kind of had my dad's engineer's voice in my head, which was like, you know, it's not a job. So, you know, maybe he was right in some ways, you know, it was probably better that I did kind of forge my way in into the world of business. And I wound up, of course, in publishing because it was the closest I could get to following my dreams without actually following my dreams. So I went into publishing and I started working in publicity. And um, unfortunately for me, I was very, very good at my job. So my job just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the time I spent writing got smaller and smaller and smaller until I reached a point in my life where I wasn't writing at all. And so I had this, this moment, this kind of epiphany where I realized that, you know, I, I had a job that I was devoting myself 110% to and which I did not love. Um, and that, you know, everything was wrong pretty much. I was with the wrong guy um, then, not my husband now, but then I was with the, the wrong guy and I was just letting the only thing that I ever really wanted just kind of slip away. I had that unfinished manuscript, you know, that I had started when I was 19 years old and I had this dream of, you know, being a writer and I was working in publishing. And at that moment in my life, I felt like I, I couldn't have been further from it um, than I was. And so, you know, I had this moment where I realized, like, you know, I'm going to have to look at myself five years or 10 years down the road and say, hey, you know what? You never even tried. You never even tried to do this. And I figured I could live with sort of spectacular crash and burn failure, but I wasn't going to be able to live with a slow fade to black. So I did from that point forward, you know, the only thing that you really need to do to be a writer. I'm sure as writers, you all know what that is. It's right. All you have to do is just sit down and write your book. So from that point in my life, I got very serious. I started writing every single day. And if that meant I stayed in when I was wanted to be out with my friends, or if that meant that I wrote on my commute into my job, or if I kind of stole time you know, scribbling notes during meetings where I should have been paying attention. Um, I, um, that's what I did. That's how I finished my first novel. So the novel that I started when I was 19 and still in college, I did eventually finish. Of course, it was 10 years later. So meanwhile, I broke up with the guy that I was with and, you know, I wrote every day on this novel and I finished it finally, you know, after, I, about a year from that point. So I finished it and, you know, I still kind of did not know what to do with it because, you know, even though I worked in publishing, I was on the publicity side of things. And, you know, also it was kind of like a closet writer, you know, it's a little bit embarrassing to be working in publishing and um, actually being a writer. It's kind of like being a waitress in LA and really being an actress. It's like sort of maybe everybody in publishing has like secret dreams of being a writer or they did at one point. And so I, you know, I kind of didn't really know what to do. I finished the book. I was just happy to have done that. Um, and I will just, you know, pause briefly here in my personal narrative to say that, you know, that really is the number one thing you need to do as an aspiring writer is you need to finish your book. The idea, you know, the journey from idea to finish novel is a very long one. And you're not as an unpublished writer or as an untried writer ever going to like sell your book on spec. You're never going to sell your idea. So if you're looking to get published, the main thing to do is to finish that work, finish that novel. Like there really is no next step until that step is done. And so I was very, you know, happy to have just at least finished a novel because a lot of people want to write a novel. I mean, I hear from people all the time, I really want to write a novel or I've always wanted to write a novel. You know, it's like, well, yes, you know, a lot of people feel that way, but very, very few people actually want to write that novel and then do it. And so I was happy that I did it because I thought, all right, at least 
you know, I've completed this big step that I knew was the most important step, but I shelved it because I was, you know, still feeling insecure, you know, really nobody had read it and I, who knows, right, if it's any good. So I kind of shelved it and I wound up going on a little vacation. I went, I took a trip to Key West. Um, and Florida people, you know, I wound up spending an evening in Key West at Sloppy Joe's. And while I was at Sloppy Joe's, I met my husband, Jeff. Um, and it was like really this kind of love at first sight sort of Shazam moment. I know what you're thinking. You know, usually relationships that start at Sloppy Joe's are a little bit more short term, shall we say. Um, but, you know, as of last November, my husband and I have been married for 20 years. So I think it's going to work out. Um, and, uh, you know, I kind of met Jeff and everything like in that moment, like my whole life just kind of pivoted. You know, I'd finished this manuscript. I had like met like this guy who was like very obviously in the first moment I met him, like the person. And, you know, within six months he had proposed we had both quit our big corporate jobs. Um, I sent my manuscript to my top five choice agents in New York City, and we, Jeff and I, moved to Florida. And, um, you know, so that was kind of a big go for broke moment. You know, like I had this finished manuscript. I decided I was like the planets had aligned. I sold my apartment in New York City and decided I'm giving myself one year giving myself one year to finish, um, to, uh, to write another book and to sell the one that I have already written. Um, and I had no expectation that that was going to work because I'd been in publishing for, for so long. And I knew that, you know, the idea that you might sell your first manuscript was probably pretty, you know, pretty fantastical, probably not going to happen, but I wanted to write, give myself a year to write another book. And so that's what I did. And um, in fact, I did sell more. I did get signed on by an agent pretty quickly. So this is like not like the normal story for most people, but this is what happened to me. I did get signed on by an agent pretty quickly. And she was able to sell that first book and the book I was writing um, after I quit my big publishing job. And, uh, you know, she brokered a two book contract with St. Martin's Press. And that was the beginning of my career. Um, which is, you know, not the usual path. Many people usually write many manuscripts, have lots of rejections before they um, before they uh, ever get published. But I, I did publish my first novel and the second one. Um, I think my advance was like a nickel and a cheese sandwich. It was like kind of a don't quit your day job advance. <laughs> Unfortunately for me, I had already quit my day job. Um, but, you know, I kind of knew... But I think a lot of aspiring writers don't know um, because I had worked in, in publishing. I knew that like a lot of writers think that the publishing contract is like, that's it. Like that's the windfall, right? That's the end of the story. You know, you've written your book. It's been published. It's, you know, huge bestseller and, you know, you're, you're set for life kind of a thing. Like there's like this fantastical idea of what it means to be a published writer, to have that book publishing contract. But I knew that it only meant an open door into the writing life and that I would have to roll up my sleeves and get to work because to succeed as a published writer is as difficult as it is to get published in the first place. And that it never stops being about the writing. It never stops being about the words on the page. And that is a really critical thing to know as a writer that, you know, you never, any, any accolade or any permission or open door that you get is really just, you know, permission to keep writing. That, that's all it is. You know, there's no, there's no end to the story, you know, unless, unless you end it or you want it to end. So there's no end to, you know, there's no like one moment where, you know, you've written this fairy tale ending, you know, it's just the publishing contract is just an open door into this life of being a writer, which, you know, for me is the only thing I've ever wanted. It's the thing I've wanted since I was a kid. Maybe the same is true for you. Um, so this is actually kind of a nice segue into this moment in time, like sort of fast forward, right? Like those were my, fir my first book was published in 2002. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I sat down to write my 
20th novel, um, which is kind of a big deal, you know, and I, I, re I remember feeling like sitting down like, okay, here I am, I'm going to sit down to write my 20th novel. And then I think to myself, does anybody remember how to do this? You know, <laughs> every time for me, it feels like the first time, like when you sort of approach that new book and you've got that idea and you're, you know, sort of ready to get into the the meat of the day-to-day -day writing and so it's a it's always a, an interesting moment like for me you know exciting i i live for the blank page i live for you know the writing life sure there are lots of hills and valleys lots of dizzying highs and kind of crushing lows but you know all in all it's you know it's a pretty it's a pretty amazing thing i feel for me my my life as a writer is a dream come true. So I always try to be grateful for that, no matter what the challenge is. Um, but, you know, obviously the last year has been challenging uh, for everyone. It's been, um, it's, you know, here right now, it's it's March. It's March uh, 2021. So just about a year since we've all been on lockdown. And, you know, uh, for writers, being on lockdown is probably not the worst thing that ever happened. Um, I know a lot of my writer pals have been very, um, you know, were very like sort of uh, unmoored by by the experience, you know, the anxiety, the fear, the darkness, you know, it can't, it can't be forgotten that this has been just a horrific time for, for so many people, even if you have not personally had COVID or don't know anybody or haven't lost anybody, this has just been an incredibly difficult and dark time for everybody. And it's, you know, it's this moment for me as a writer where I, I have realized that um, creativity, that space of being in the work is, uh, it's a haven for me. It's always been an escape hatch. I've always been able to climb, you know, open the door and sort of climb through into this other world that I am creating and leave behind the one that, you know, is like, you know, often seems to be completely out of my control. I mean, you know, <laughs> as much as I try to control everything, you know, the world certainly seems to do its own thing and, you know, talk about the ultimate pop plot twist. Like of all the things you were worried about at the end of 2019, I'm sure a global pandemic was not among them. Um, so, you know, life has this way of just kind of throwing us these big curl curveballs, but in creativity, in the, in the process of writing, you know, you really can um, ex exert at least some control, at least over your novel. So one of the things that I wrote at the beginning of the pandemic, which kind of ties into something else that I've been writing about for a while, which is, you know, creativity and how to get to that space and all the things that we do to keep ourselves from that space, which, you know, as writers, we, we all know, you know, procrastination is like kind of the name of the game. I don't know why, you know, I actually just wrote about this recently. I like to call it productive procrastination, like the things that you do that like seem very important, but like that keep you from doing the one thing that you really want to do and need to do. So I'm not sure why we all do this, but, but we definitely do. And um, I, at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, I did write this piece called Creativity and Chaos. And so I'm going to take a few pieces from that and you just kind of talk about how, you know, during times of crisis, how we can find our way to the page and to, to the writing, which, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning is really the only important thing. I mean, it's the only thing as writers that we control and the only thing, you know, as published writers even that we control. So I'm just going to do, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about that. So um, it's always, chaos has always been a factor. At the beginning of 2019, I read an article in the New York Times book review about Jenny Offal. And she was talking about, she, she had this brilliant quote where she said, you know, can you just tend to your own garden when you know that there's a fire outside its walls? And she, at that time, you know, she was talking about climate change. So, you know, the world has always been kind of on fire a little bit. You know, there's always sort of darkness and, and things that can be distractions and, you know, things that can take us from the work. And in fact, you know, in our own lives, even if you don't, you know, even if you're, you're not concerned about what's going on outside your walls, 
for most writers, you know, there's a slew of obligations that take you away from the page, especially if you're not a professional published writer. If you're a professional published writer like I am, it's your job and it's your job to get to the page. So that's, you know, in some ways a benefit. Um, but, you know, for the aspiring writer, like there's not always a ton of permission to do that thing, to, to dedicate yourself to the page because you have, you, you have another job, maybe you have a spouse, you have children, you have, you know, maybe you're caring for an elderly parent or, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you have a slew of ob obligations, a gauntlet that has to be run in order to get to the page. Um, and these obligations can derail us for days, um, for, for months, for, for years, as I'm sure you know, in a, in a group of writers, we all know the journey to the page and to the writing life can be very complicated and isn't easy and it isn't always possible. But, you know, I believe that if you have that, you know, that drive, that story in your heart, that thing that you want to do, that there is a way to get there. Creativity, the idea of creativity is not a, it's not like an island that is so remote, um, a place where you may never visit. It's not, ma it's not necessarily magical. It's not flighty or, um, you know, inconsistent. Creativity, in fact, is a cho is a choice, and it's a place where we choose to go. And there are certain ways that you can make it make it more accessible to yourself. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So once upon a time, I went to a writer's conference and I heard a creative writing teacher speak and she was, you know, quite well versed and had a lot of interesting things to say. And then at the end, she had a Q&A section and one of the people who um, spoke up said, well, I've always, you know, wanted, I always want to write. I really want to write a book, but I just can't find the time. And this writing professor said, and I'll never forget this. She said, if you're not creative enough to find the time to write, then you are not creative enough to write. What do you think about that? I know it's a little, it's a little harsh, right? But, you know, there is kind of a grain of truth to that. And um, I have found that in my life that the best time, you know, during the pandemic and, you know, during the normal chaos of life to write is first thing in the morning um, before anybody else is up when I am closest to my dream brain. Um, the, there's a couple hours in the day that nobody else in the world wants. And those hours are from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. <laughs> of course, that means you don't get to sleep, but that's okay. So like, this is a, you know, I, I no longer, well, I do sometimes, sometimes I'm awoken in the middle of the night by my story and I kind of get to that, you know, 4 a.m. place. I don't really prioritize 4 a.m. anymore. I did when my daughter was very small. I did when I had a full-time job, um, you know, like there's these hours that like nobody else wants. Like it's this super quiet time where there, you know, you get to the page before, before you even thought about the news or the social media, your editor is not awake, like your real editor in New York or your internal editor, like neither one of those folks are awake. And hopefully nobody's calling. The UPS guy isn't coming. Your mom's not on the phone, I hope, at between 4 and 6 a.m. And so you have this really sort of sacred early morning time that if you claim it, and it doesn't have to be 4 to 6, it can be whatever hours are available to you and that are that are free space. For some of my writer friends, you know, um, the it's the, the, the other end of the day. It's the nighttime after everyone has gone to sleep. And that is, you know, those are, you know, probably the hours from midnight to two. So I have some friends who really like those late night hours. They have the same feeling of being like pulled out of like normal life. And that's really, you know, what you need to find. You need to find that space. For me, I'm an early bird. So those early morning hours are very important to me. For my friend, she's a night owl. 
So she's going to gravitate towards that. But the important thing is that you find those hours and then you, you use them for only for your writing. So you don't get up at 4 a.m. to, you know, get on Twitter or you don't, you know, get up at four or, or stay up until midnight to watch funny cat videos on Facebook or like stalk your ex on social media, whatever it is that, you know, these time wasters that we do in front of our computers. Um, but like, it's important that you find your space and that you honor it as regularly as possible because this is the sort of one of the little known things about creativity is that when you make a date with yourself to be available for creativity, you will be amazed at how often creativity meets you there. There's an element of discipline, time, attention, and you know, setting a schedule and honoring it, there's an element of discipline that sort of creates a fertile field for creativity. Like when you know, I have this time and I have these hours no matter what, um, you're gonna be amazed at how much you get done if you, on, if you set that schedule and you honor that schedule. So my advice is to do it before everybody wakes up, before the news, before everything, or after or whenever you find your little block of time that is just yours. Easier said than done, but you know, it's, it's a worthy pursuit. Um, the other thing to remember about creativity in a time of chaos, you know, is that creativity is control. In, you know, in life, <laughs> in that real world, like outside your fictional world, in life, it, there's not, there's not a whole lot of control. Maybe, maybe you've picked up on this. Maybe you haven't, you know, it took me a pretty long time. Um, but you know, there's not a whole lot of control. Like when you turn on the news, when you even look outside your window, you know, there are things going on that are just beyond anything that you can do. Um, and so there's like a certain level of helplessness that you feel when you're like turn on the news and it's just, one bad thing after another, one negative thing. And it really can sort of, you know, lower your energy levels to a degree that makes it difficult to be creative. And that is, um, you know, something a lot of my writer friends have said over the last year, you know, how difficult it is to be creative when you just are constantly bombarded with bad news, bad news, you know, and you feel like this heaviness of the world. Um, but, you know, my answer to that is that, you know, creativity is control. There is no other place in life where you have as much control as you do on the page. And the escape into that space as a writer helps you, or I should say, can helps me to metabolize the chaos that I perceive in the world. You know, I write psychological suspense. I write thrillers. I've always had this kind of dark imagination. I've always had this kind of big response to the darkness that I perceive in the world. And a lot of my novels are really just me answering questions about things that trouble me, things that frighten me, things that, you know, I am trying, you know, very hard to understand. And so the page has become that for me, has become a space of control where I can look at the things in the world that, you know, that are dark, that are hard to fathom and find a way to make them understandable to, for myself and for my readers. I mean, I would argue that, you know, thriller writers turn to the page to metabolize darkness. Thriller readers also turn to the page to metabolize darkness. Like Lee Child is famous for saying that, you know, probably the first thriller ever written was um, a drawing on the wall of a cave because, you know, these were the, you know, like the, the, the ordinary person, you know, kills the lion or the ordinary person like fights off the predator. You know, these are the stories that we tell each other to make ourselves feel braver in the darkness. And so I think that's why I've turned to thriller writing, you know, as, as my, you know, main medium. And I think that's why a lot of thriller writers come or thriller readers come to the page because, you know, we're looking to metabolize darkness and within the page, there's a beginning and the middle and an end usually there's some kind of just deserved 
you know, not so in the real world. So in creativity, there is control. So that's yet another reason for you to find your way there, even in the midst of, you know, all the madness that goes on. Um, you know, the other thing about this moment in time is just to, you know, breathe. Nothing, you know, a lot of my writer friends are, you know, they're professional writers and, you know, they have deadlines and, um, you know, things that they have to do and have to turn in. So that is something that is, um, you know, uh, is, a, is a challenge for the published writer. You know, you have a job, you have a career, you know, like you, you don't really have the luxury of, uh, of not doing the work. Um, so, you know, one of the things I tell them when we have these discussions is just, you know, just breathe. Um, nothing of any quality ever came forth in a panic. You know, you have to trust your gift. You have to trust your skill. You have to trust the work to, you know, bring itself to life in some ways, you know, only of course, once you're present and, you know, in your scheduled time creating the work, but there is a, there is a aspect of allowing that is critical to the creative process. It's not all about just like panicked, forcing the words onto the page. It's like, there's an element of breathing and allowing the story to come forth. So, you know, in those moments when you're feeling tremendously stressed, uh, tremendously overwhelmed by events of the world, tremendously overwhelmed by obligations. You know, there is a benefit to sitting and breathing and bringing yourself to the page in a space of calm, because that is really, you know, it's a relaxation response. It's a release. And once you have released the tension and the fear and the chaos and all of that, and, you know, whatever, you know, whatever you've sort of taken from the outside and like, you know, taken on as your own, there is a benefit to breathing and allowing the creativity to flow through you. Um, the other thing I'd like to say about, especially this pandemic time is that, you know, this is an unprecedented moment in history and things have happened in the last year that have never happened before. And um, changes in people and society have really just accelerated in a way that I don't think anybody could have predicted. So this is a um, very uh, wild and, you know, unprecedented moment in our human history. And the writer, of course, is first and foremost the observer. I mean, this is what we are before the page. You know, we are the people who are taking in the details. We're the people who are observing. We're the ones who are listening. We're the ones that are, you know, trying, who are gonna be called upon to metabolize the events of the day. Which is not to say that you're necessarily gonna write a pandemic novel. I, I don't think that I will, probably not. And if I do, it won't be for many years until after, you know, things have started to make sense to me in a, in a, you know, in an organic way. But, you know, taking every detail that you take in, everything that you observe, every thought that you have right now is important because it is going to, it is going to um, inform your work. It is going to inform your fiction, whether now or a year from now or five years from now, you don't really know how the things that are happening are gonna find their way onto the page. So it's very important in this moment to be an observer, to make sure that you are present and accounted for and you know, in that watcher mind, in that observer mind, so that you can hold on to these details and really, you know, take from this moment what is good, what is valuable what is worthy, what is instructional. You know, there are, there is all that as well. There isn't just darkness here. There is also, you know, a tremendous light. There's tremendous, you know, lessons to be learned. So as a writer, it's your moment to really observe those things and have them be something not just, not that takes you from your work, but something that informs you 
informs your work. Um, the other thing I like to talk about during this time is, and this is, a, this is actually true all the time, um, but it just sort of came to the forefront during the pandemic, and it's count your wins. Uh, as writers, you know, I think we're all like a little bit self-critical. I don't know. Um, maybe this. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> I don't know if it's true of all of all writers, but I'm always like very self-critical, and it's very easy for me to be like, oh, I didn't do enough, or I didn't do this, or I didn't do that. And I think we all do that, and then you know, add the pandemic on top of it, and like a lot of your agency had just been kind of stripped away from you. It's like you really can't do all the things that you normally do to metabolize, you know, anxiety or stress or whatever. You know, there's a lot of things that have been taken away. So like you really need to count your wins, like any page that you wrote, any thought that you had, anytime you touched your manuscript, anytime you were able to dedicate an hour to yourself during this crazy, crazy time. Like I, I was encouraging people to just, you know, be grateful for that. Be happy that you were able to do that. Congratulate yourself. Just go, you know, good writer. You, you know, you wrote a paragraph today because like that kind of positivity, you know, sort of breeds more, you know, gratitude for what you were able to do. You don't want to be in a perpetual state of perfectionism and criticism and all that, because those, those are really the enemies of creativity. It, chaos and fear and anxiety and all that, they're not the real enemies. The real enemies are, are, um, you know, hypercritical, you know, hyper perfectionism. Those are the things that really keep us from the page. They keep us kind of locked up, you know, like not wanting to put anything down on paper because like, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be right. You know? So as long as you're in that headspace, that mind, um, you really are going to, um, you know, kind of block yourself, you know, tie yourself up in knots. So just remember to count your wins and, you know, you're probably doing more than you think you're doing, you know, whether it's poetry or screenwriting or journaling or however it is that you're keeping yourself writing, um, you know, you're probably doing more than you think you're doing. So definitely count those wins. Um, and the last thing I'm going to leave you with um, for creativity and chaos is, you know, very super unsexy idea that is kind of antithetical to the, you know, the idea of the, the writer, you know, waiting for inspiration, waiting for the muse, you know, that whole thing about like, you know, oh, the spirit moved me and I wrote this entire novel. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, sure. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, you really can't keep those pages from coming. You have, you're, you know, full of ideas and thoughts and you just are really, you know, um, in the zone, so to speak. Um, so yeah, sometimes that's true, but mainly, you know, for a, a speaking strictly as a, you know, professional working writer, somebody who's been working, you know, in publishing and as a writer for, you know, probably uh, about 30 years. Um, I will say that probably the most important thing that you can do for yourself as a writer is set a schedule. Um, I know it's so unsexy. It's so like, oh no, I can't do that. I need like the perfect airy with like my steaming cup of coffee and like everything needs to be perfect in my life. And you know, when that's true, then the story's going to come and it's just, no, probably not. So I very much suggest, this is a, I'll, I'll suggest a book that was kind of a game changer for me as a creative. It's a book called Deep Work by Cal Newport. And he very strongly suggests scheduling or batching creative time or deep work time. And this is something that I do, and I have found it to be very important that you set a schedule for your creative time and you honor that schedule. We talked a little bit about it at the beginning, like, you know, finding those early hours or finding those late hours. And that's a little, a little bit more amorphous, but this is a little bit more nuts and bolts. So you cannot have a, um, a toggle between um, your social media stuff that you do and your deep creative work. If you do that, you're creating a kind of creative drag where you're really not giving either, you're not giving your full self to anything that you're doing. So when you have, um, when you're looking at your week and you're looking, whether you're a professional writer or whether you're an aspiring you look at your schedule for the week and you set blocks of time that are just 
for creative work. You know, for me, my, my strong blocks of time are the very early morning. Um, I still am at my desk usually by six, sometimes later now the pandemic and my daughter's home and things are a little bit chaotic, but the point is I do block off these hours, you know, sometimes two or three or four or even five hours where I am not going to be doing anything but writing or things that nourish the writing. There's not going to be any answering emails or social media or, or whatever. And this can change day to day. It doesn't have to be, you know, because writers are, are like, oh my God, a grid. I don't know what to do with that. Like you can change that day to day based on your schedule. But the point is that you set these creative blocks and you honor them. You honor them as you would honor anything that was important to you. If you had an appointment with your personal trainer, if you were celebrating the birthday of a friend, or if you had a date with your husband, you'd set these things in your schedule and you would honor them and you would really think twice about canceling. You know, you would really think twice about canceling your important date with your friend or with your husband or with your doctor or with whomever. You'd be like, oh, I really don't want to cancel because I don't want to let that person down. But you'll, you know, immediately just kind of slough off that two hour creative time that you scheduled for yourself. So, you know, you want to set those hours and really honor them in the way that you would honor anything that was important to you or that was important to somebody that you cared about. Because I'm just going to put out there that if you have the desire to write and you've been writing or you have a project that you're working on, that it is worthy, that it is a goal. I can't tell you if you'll ever get published. I can't tell you what, you know, what will be the outcome of these hours. But I will tell you that I believe if you have a drive and you have a goal, um, that setting the blocked times and, you know, honoring those blocked creative periods is critical because you will not finish the work any other way. The work does not write itself. It does not magically complete. The only way to, the only way from idea to finish novel is by logging the hours and putting the words onto the page. And there's no other way to do that except to block the time and honor the time that you blocked. So set the schedule and honor the schedule. It's, you know, not very sexy, but it may be, you know, the most important building block of this talk um, or of this life, of the writing life. Because, you know, again, as I said at the very beginning, it, it, publishing is not windfall. It's not the end of the story. It's only an open door to the writing life. And now even 20 novels in, it is never stopped being about the words on the page. Nothing else matters. That is that is the only thing that matters. So as I come to the end of this talk, which is probably a little bit too long, but um, that's just, you know, that's just me. I will say one thing that I always like to say to my aspiring writers, because I think it's important to hear. Um, Publishing should be incidental. The idea of getting published should be incidental and, and second to the idea of I am going to become a better writer. So even for me, even now for me, every day, the thing that motivates me is that I believe that I could be a better writer today than I was yesterday. And I truly believe that because I believe the more time you spend honing your craft and um, digging deeper and being a better observer and, you know, connecting to your inner calm and, you know, scheduling your time, I do believe that it is, it never stops being, it never stops being about that. It never stops being about getting to be a better writer today than I was yesterday. So just remember that, you know, publishing may come, it may be in your future, you may be able to do it, you know, plenty of people do, um, but just make sure that you are at the page for the right reason. And, that reason is to be a better writer today than you were yesterday. Um, and I will also go on to say this, that, you know, there is not a working published writer today. There's not one single bestseller or prize winner or, you know, internationally famous author that you can think of who was not at one point an aspiring writer sitting in a room um, with a manuscript, 
wondering whether he or she was good enough. Every single person of who is successful today was at one person at one point that person. You know, you just had your work in front of you and this dream in your heart and you know a whole chorus of doubts and naysayers and people telling you you can't do it nobody can do this you know it's too hard nobody gets published you know like there was never a person there's not one single person today who was not at one point in that position so wherever you are in your career whether you're a published writer or whether you're an aspiring writer just remember that you know um, and remember that, you know, it's always about the page. So no matter where you are in your career, you're exactly where you need to be. Um, I wish you all the very best of luck. I hope that um, you will t walk away from this with like restored creativity and some nuts and bolts and building blocks for getting to your creative space um, when, you know, when the world is in chaos, which, you know, Unfortunately, it seems always to be in chaos, um, but you're the writer, so, you know, nose to the keyboard or pen to paper and, you know, just get to work. It's, uh, it's not easy, but it is simple. Thank you so much for, for listening. Um, please do send me your comments and your questions at lisa at lisaunger.com. I'd love to hear from you and uh, best of luck with your writing. Finally, I'd like to take the opportunity to bring you probably one of the most anticipated parts of our conference, and that are the award winners. So I have had so much work and so much effort and enjoyment by these chairs. It's been unbelievable what they've been willing to offer to us for the letters and art and composition awards, as well as the Individual Achievement Award, and of course, the Pen Woman of the Year. I hope that you enjoy this thoroughly and take it in for what it is, because these pen women are some gals to love. Good luck to all of you. Welcome, I'm Tammy Seymour, and I'm honored to be your art chair for our 2021 Biennial Art Show. COVID prevented us from having an in-person conference this year, but fortunately the show will go on with our virtual exhibit and awards ceremony. I put out a challenge earlier in the year to the branch presidents to see how many entries we could get, knowing that entering shows virtually doesn't come that easy to some of us. I was both excited with the number and quality of entries we received. We had a great response with 32 artists emailing their entries from as far away as Greece. Having access to your artwork from your tablet or phone makes virtual shows easy to enter, even when on vacation. Then I was floored when 95-year-old Marcy Van Cohorn from our Vero Beach branch was able to get her artwork off her iPhone with enough resolution to compete. Congratulations to everyone who got their images to me and competed in this juried show. Our judge, Diane Nance, reviewed all the work and juried in artwork to present a cohesive show, just as if it was to hang on gallery walls. Good news, everyone got at least one piece juried into this show and is part of this video. I will email everyone a link of this video so that you can share with family, friends, and your collectors. Anyone who's ever judged a show will tell you that on any given day that they select for an award can change, depending on so many variables. So keep entering shows and your day will come, even if it didn't today. Our judge, Diane Nance, responds to both bold and sensitive paintings, especially when there is an unexpected element. Judges love to be surprised. That surprise can be an unexpected what, such as subject, juxtaposition, or attitude. Or it can be an unexpected how, simplicity, boldness, 
oddness, clarity, or elegance. Our prize winners had all of these. Congratulations to them all. We will be presenting 10 cash awards today from our entry dollars and donation received. And the award winners are Judges Record Judy Nuno, 200 Steamed Dumplings. Judges Recognition, Patricia Setzer for Eternal Deals. Honorable Mention for Susan Casparo for African Crowned Crane. Honorable Mention to Sharon Demarest for Slaying the Dragon. Honorable mention goes to Kirsten Hines for Vultures. Honorable mention goes to Sue Lynn Cotton for Delectable Dish. Our third place winner is Beatrice Athanas for Monasteries of Meteora. Our second place winner goes to Norma Sumner for Bermuda Roof. Our first place winner goes to Phoenix Early Morning Fog. And our best in show goes to Lois Perdue for Chasing the Blue. Congratulations to everyone, but the show goes on.
And that's all, folks. See you next biennial. On behalf of 2021 Compositions Chair, Dr. Joan Cartwright, it is my privilege to announce this year's winners. First, allow me to express much gratitude to Judge Susan Latman for her expertise and love of music. Now, on to the announcements. For third place, from the Boca Raton branch, by Dr. Joan Cartwright, Mellow Autumn. Congratulations, Joan. Taking second place this year is Sheila Firestone, also from the Boca Raton branch, for her piece titled Restoring Balance. And finally, taking first place in the 2021 Compositions Awards is Kay Williamson from Cape Canaveral for her piece titled Christmas Day. Bravo. Bravo, Kay.
on behalf of the National League of American Pen Women and the 2021 Conference Virtual. We thank you so much for entering all of the wonderful pieces to be judged by one of the best judges in the business. We thank you so, so very much and congratulations to all. Three women are networking at a party. Anna says, I make $75,000 a year after taxes. Beth asks, what do you do for a living? Anna says, I'm a stockbroker. How much do you make? Beth says, I should clear 60,000 this year. Anna asks, what do you do? Beth says, I'm an architect. Mary has been standing quietly staring into her drink when the others turn to her. Beth asks, hey, how much do you make? Mary says, I guess about $13,000. Anna asks, oh, really? What kind of stories do you write? Hi, I'm Barbara Routon, chairperson of this year's state biennial letters competition. I'm vice president of the Tampa branch and a letters and music member. Most writers live this joke, and that's why professional awards like these given out by the Florida State Association of the National League of American Pen Women are so important. They provide us overdue affirmation, encouragement, and a teensy smidge of compensation. As chair of this year's letters competition, I wanted the contest rules to be more inclusive of the great variety of writing genres that our pen women represent. Anything that would qualify a person for NLAPW letters membership was fair game, from writing song lyrics to marketing copy to an online lecture. Our professional writing as pen women encompasses so much more than just poetry, books, and stories. It includes mass communications and writing in the di digital domain. And that is a great part of the future of writing. I'm extremely grateful that so many of you responded. You made the contests exciting and competitive. We received dozens of submissions, multiple entries in every category. There were blog posts, nature books, PowerPoint presentations, play scripts, a libretto, a ghost-written autobiography, historical fiction, magazine articles, murder mysteries, and collaborative cross-genre works. The field was wide open and contained so many good submissions that several of our judges, all of whom are specialists in their field, found it hard to make their selections. They judged the competition objectively and blindly, that is, not having been given the names of or any other identifying information about any of the authors whose works they evaluated. I'm extremely grateful to each of the judges for their willingness to perform this task for us punctually and for doing it with thoroughness, sensitivity, humility, and professionalism. The judges looked for elements of great writing such as correct grammar, syntax, and spelling, clarity of expression, development of story, plot, pacing, credible world building and characters and timeline, proper use of poetic forms, originality and creativity, and literary devices used appropriately, as well as the professionalism of the presentation and adherence to contest rules. When a category had five or fewer submissions, the judges awarded only a first place and honorable mention. When 20 or more entries were received, the judges chose first, second, and third places, and three honorable mentions. For categories with six to 19 submissions, a first, second, and third place were given. Every possible award was granted. And the winning writers whose pieces they chose were in the children's and young adult literature category. Mary Ann Miller, Honorable mention for Paul Bunyan, A Tall Tale Retold. 
Donna De Leo Bruno, first place for What No Child Should See, with its intriguing first sentence, in 1941, the year I was 12 years old, the Germans entered my small town in the Provençal countryside. Congratulations to both of you. In the short stories, scripts, and libretti category, the third place award goes to Claire Massey for Tantrum on the Beach, second place to Patricia Ann Williams for A Slippery Slope, and first place to Patricia Blackgold for Murder in Hell's Kitchen. Congratulations to all of you. In the traditional poetry category, Kay Williams won honorable mention for Farewell Summer, Farewell Love. Karen Morris, first place for her Lukbat, A Spring Still Winter. Lukbat, and I have no idea how to pronounce that, is a traditional form of Vietnamese poetry that means 6-8 referring to alternating lines of six and eight syllables. Congratulations to you too for your poems. In the free verse poetry category, the winners are Claire Massey, honorable mention for Corona Sphere, Vera Horsh Hirshhorn, honorable mention for In Storms, Jeannie Carlson, honorable mention for Sunken Gardens Flamingo Conference, Karen Morris, third place for Leavings, Lorraine Walker-Williams, second place for The Telling, and Dorothy Cam, first place for Satori. Congratulations to you all. In the Memoirs, Personal Essays, and Inspirational category, our winners are Mary Jane Ingui, third place for Mom's Midnight Snack, Andrea Jones Walker, second place for 29 Houses, A Moving Journey, and co-authors Wilma Davidson and Diana Diavola, first place for Soldier Sister Savant. Congratulations to the four of you. We had three winners in the Writing for the Digital Domain category. They are Carolyn Scully, third place for Remembering Grandparents, Sandy Huff, second place for her PowerPoint presentation, Tampa Bay Flowering Shrubs, and Jeannie Carlson, first place for setting the table for your story. Congratulations to you all. In the adult fiction category, the winners are Carol White, third place for Metamorphosis, Jan Searsant, second place for A Brooklyn Love Story, Deborah De Farias, first place for Standing Tall, about an Argentinian rancher's daughter who fought to become a physician in a male-dominated society. Congratulations to each of you. The adult nonfiction category had two winners, Sandy Huff, honorable mention for Paddler's Guide to the Sunshine State, and Deborah O'Reilly, first place for her ghost writing of, if you have confidence, you have everything. Sincere congratulations to you guys. In the communications category, the winners are Jeannie Carlson, honorable mention for Through a Glass Lightly, St. Pete's Hidden Glass Art Treasures. Mary Jane Ingui, first place for the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. Congratulations, Jeannie and Mary Jane. Congratulations to all of you who won, and a huge thank you to everyone who submitted a piece for these contest categories. The competition was successful because of each of your entries. Be very encouraged. Some of these contests were very close. And remember, whatever you write, as Kate de Camillo said, stories are light. Light is precious in a world so dark. Begin at the beginning, make some light. Please keep shining your light by continuing to write. And remember to submit more of your wonderful works for the next State Biennial.
the 2021 Individual Achievement Award goes to Susan Shuniki from the Jacksonville branch. In the letter of nomination, Suzanne was recognized for her extraordinary and inspiring talent, as well as her active engagement in the Jacksonville branch, as well as her continuing involvement in shows and presentations during the past two years, despite the pandemic. And the judge wrote, While reviewing reviewing Suzanne's submissions, I was immediately struck by her impressive list of accomplishments. Her successful year, including curating exhibitions, book design, co-authoring, solo exhibitions, and presentations. This is quite the achievement for an artist, but to do so during a pandemic is certainly laudable. Suzanne's art has the magical ability to abstract recognizable image using curves and lines that are sophisticated and full of intrigue. It is easy to see why so many highly revered sites, museums, and galleries want to exhibit her work. It is Suzanne's notable list of awards and exhibitions that make her the clear choice to receive the honor from the National League of American Penwomen for individual achievement. Congratulations, Suzanne. Hi, my name is Mary Dahl, and I am pleased to announce that the newest Florida State Pen Woman of the Year is Pensacola's own Karen McAlperty Morris. Congratulations. Congratulations to everyone, and many thanks for those who made the submissions to enjoy doing their workshops, because we enjoyed them very much, for becoming a part of, in everything that you know and everything that you do, it has been a wonderful conference for me, and I'm sure for everyone that has watched it. I hope to see you next two years from now, whether it's live or virtually or, well, who knows? Maybe a little bit of both. You just never know. In the meantime, all for one and one for all. So long.
I think it's a fascinating look by two of our greatest letters members, Claire Massey and Karen Morse. And it is called writing. <laughs> Let's do the little walk. <laughs> it's called. Writing. Do you think? Do you hear any mouth noise? No, not that. Okay. Picking up a little bit of. Shh, shh, shh. Okay. Writing with precision and power. Writing with precision and power. Okay. Well, if there was ever a saying that was more true, when the tough gets going the going gets tough. So, you know, I said I said fucking backwards, didn't I? <laughs> I would love for you to take the opportunity to see how hard these chairs worked and how ingenuitive they're, that's not a word, is it? Is it? Ingenuitive? I don't even know, I'm gonna start again, sorry. Lengthy mm -hmm. line of credits that I think you will find to be very fascinating. All of the people who spend time and efforts, all for one. One for all.